Good evening, Facebook family. Good evening, YouTube family. I'm so glad that y'all could join me for Wednesday night Bible study. We are getting into the Word of God today, and we are in Colossians chapter 3. But the spillover from last week, I got some questions. I got tons of comments. You know, y'all been kind of flooding my inbox. We've been talking about forgiveness, but I've got some very poignant questions. Um, how do I forgive someone who doesn't deserve forgiveness? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, a couple of people asked me for steps, which I get, because I told you when we started Colossians, if you tell me I need to do something, then I'm going to need you to tell me how to do it. So that's what we're going to talk about. So it's not really a finish. We're not going to finish Colossians chapter three today, but we are still in Colossians chapter three. I'm going to read verses 12 to 14. Those are going to be our focal verses um, this evening. Um, if you, this would probably be a good Bible study for you to take some notes. If you want to take some notes, I got seven steps on how I forgive someone or how do I forgive when I just don't know how, but I wanted to title it, how do I forgive someone who doesn't deserve forgiveness? It's really kind of a little bit of a trick question because nobody deserves forgiveness, like nobody does. And sometimes when we say it, it's like the person who isn't sorry, the person who hasn't, hasn't asked for forgiveness. But the truth of the matter is, None of us deserve forgiveness. So how do I forgive someone who doesn't deserve forgiveness is the same as just saying, well, how do I forgive? How do I forgive when I just don't know how? And so that's where we are. We, you know, we got into it last week and I, we talked about, we looked at different scriptures. We talked about how God requires us to forgive others and it left some of us kind of baffled. Well, how do I do that then? And so I believe that there's a word from the Lord tonight. We're going to get into it. I'm going to open up with a word of prayer. If you want to take some notes, then you can do that. Um, and so let's, uh oh, it looks like my YouTube froze. So we'll see, because this is a word. So we'll see how YouTube does. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for your grace and your mercy. I thank you, God, for your loving kindness. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would speak to me and speak through me. Father, we desire to hide your word in our hearts so that we won't sin against you. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts and our minds tonight. Father, you have told us repeatedly in your word that we must forgive others. We must forgive. You said that if we don't forgive others, others for their sins that our heavenly father will not forgive us our sins and so as we study tonight and learn how to do that how to do it i pray father that you will open up our hearts and our minds that you would give us a word that will transform us that will shape us and mold us into the men and women of god that you called and created us to be a word father god that will help us not to sin against you a word that will deliver us from our destructions you are the faithful god that has called me you said you also would do it I pray that you would do it now, God, for your glory, for your holy name's sake, and for the advancement of your great kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, yeah, they saying on YouTube is no sound. Mm -mm -mm. That's how I know I got a word from the Lord. Um, I am not going to, I'm just going to teach it on Facebook and then I'll upload it to YouTube afterward. Um, hopefully those on YouTube will switch over to Facebook, but I know this, this is a word that will set us free. This is a word that will help us to grow in our relationship with the Lord. Um, when we're really trying to live out this thing, we desire to please him. We desire to be who he wants us to be. So how do I forgive when I just don't know how the first step is seven steps. Um, the first step is to be honest with God. And we actually talked about this last week when I was saying, you got to just start where you are. Um, before you do anything else, you have to own it. Before we do anything else, we have to own that, um, you know, I don't, I hate them. I, you Lord, you know, the only reason I'm even thinking about forgiving them is because you told me to. Wherever you are, wherever your pain level is, you have to be honest with God. And um, Psalm 51 verse 6 says, behold, you desire truth in the inward part and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. And so we have to be honest with God. He says, I desire, one version says, I desire honesty from the womb. Wait a minute. Yeah. Okay. I'll say somebody tell them to go to Facebook, but she did. She told them to go to Facebook. So you desire honesty from the womb. And Isaiah 30, 19 says how gracious he will be when we ask for help. As soon as he hears, I usually say he will surely resound, respond to the sound of your cries, which is what the New Living Translation says. But the NIV says, as soon as he hears, he will answer you. 
And so when you call, he says, if you call me, I will answer. If you ask for help, I will give it. And then not only does he say he will be gracious to us when we ask for help, but the Bible says as soon as he hears us, he, as soon as he hears, he will answer us. He will surely res respond to the sound of our cry. So we have to um, be honest with God and be like, all right, God, this is where I'm at. So often we, we act like, you know, we're good. And so often we also, one of the things that God wants to get to the root of when I say start where you are and begin to unpack whatever's going on, wherever your unforgiveness lies with God is because God will get to the root of whatever's going on. The offense, the trauma, the impact that it has on you. If you um, follow my morning devotion on Jumpstart with Jesus a couple weeks ago, we talked about how anger is the primary emotion and because it's easier, it's like a defense emotion. So we get angry because it is easier to deal with anger when we're dealing with other people where other emotions like fear or sadness leave us vulnerable. But God will unpack that. You just got to be honest with him. Like this is where I'm at. I am angry. I hate them, wherever the case may be. So that's number one. You got to be honest with God. The second thing you have to do is you have to decide to forgive. And it may sound like what, but it is everything we do. We have to make a decision. You have to make a decision to forgive. And remember now, nobody deserves forgiveness. So you can't let it play in your mind about how they don't deserve forgiveness. Okay, you're right. No one does. They don't de deserve forgiveness, but you have to decide. Let me read Daniel 1.8. Daniel 1.8 says, um, from the New Living Translation, but Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chiefs of staff for permission not to eat the unacceptable foods. When he got carted away into, um, you know, exile with the rest of the Hebrews or whatever, and he was pulled into the king's service, and the king said, teach him, train him for three years, and the king gave them a king's portion of food, but it was all kinds of meat, pork, wine, all of that, that a good Hebrew didn't didn't eat or drink and the bible says that daniel new living translation says that daniel was determined not to defile himself the new king james version says that daniel purposed in his heart that i'm not going to do this thing the one version says he resolved that he was not going to do this thing and it's going to take some resolve to forgive you're going to have to purpose in your heart i'm gonna forgive them Period, end of sentence. My conditional, my forgiveness is not going to be conditional. I'm not going to wait for them to deserve it. I'm not going to wait for them to be sorry. I'm not going to wait for them to recognize what they did. Sometimes the person you got to forgive is dead, but you still got to forgive them. And so you have to purpose in your heart. You may not know how to yet. We're going to talk about that tonight, the how to. But the first thing you got to do after you are honest with God about where you are is say, okay, you tell me I have to forgive them. I will forgive them and you decide that you're going to forgive the same way you decide you decide what you're going to eat for dinner you decide what you're going to wear to work we make decisions all day long and sometimes we're so willy-nilly with our life like instead of being intentional and you know conquering the day you know taking the day deciding how my day is going to be who i am and am not going to let bother me or work my last nerves we just kind of let things come but when we are intentional, when we make decisions, you can make a decision about how you're going to feel. You can make a decision about the kind of day you're going to have. And it doesn't mean that bad things won't happen, but I've already made a decision. You can make the um, Philippians 4, 4 says rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. You can make a decision. You can make a choice to rejoice. You can make a decision that you're going to rejoice. And I'm just saying that you have to make a decision to forgive. So we have to, it starts with a decision and I'm saying that and I'm emphasizing it because because that acknowledges, which also I touched on last week, that forgiveness is not a feeling. Like we give too much, we all have feelings and there's nothing wrong with them, but I think sometimes we give too much credence or too much power to our feelings. You don't have to feel like forgiving something. You know how we do, but like, mm, I'm just not feeling it. I'm just not feeling it. So what? So what you're not feeling it? You don't have to forget, feel it to forgive them. You just have to decide to do so. And so that's the second thing. The third thing, and it's getting harder and harder, but we're going to do this. If you're serious about it, if you're serious about how you forgive someone, then the third thing is you have to pray for them. You have to pray for them regularly and you have to pray for them intentionally. Remember, I know I'm dating myself, but remember the first Karate Kid the, with Mr. Miyagi and all of that? And he was in the house and he was cleaning and he was scrubbing the floor and he was painting the fence. He was painting the fence and he was waxing on and waxing off and all of that. And day in and day out, like he wanted to learn karate. And every day he would go and he would work on his fingers to the bone until he was exhausted. 
And he was like, you know what? This is crap. <laughs> He's like, I ain't doing this no more. And he went to storm off and Mr. Miyagi stopped him and was like, do wax on, wax off. And he was like, he's like, do it right, you know. And all of those things. And as he did those repetitive motions, Mr. Miyagi showed him that he was learning karate all along. And I'm saying that number three is like that. You're like, what does praying for them have to do with me forgiving them? I can't even explain it to you. It may not look right away like it is connected, but you have to pray for them and you have to pray for them regularly. You have to pray for them intentionally. And I'm not talking about your um, prayers that you've been praying before, like, yeah, Lord, get them, let them get what they deserve. Let them get what they got coming to them. I'm not talking about the prayers that you've been praying. I am talking about praying for them, especially every time they come to mind and you are going to pray for them. And when you are praying for them, you are also going to pray for you. And what you're going to ask God is you're going to ask God to flood your heart with love for them. And you're going to ask God to allow you to see them the way he sees them. Whew, that's heavy, but that's what you're going to pray. If you're serious about this thing, ask God, let me see them the way you see them. Because right now you see them the way you see them. But God sees them too. And what you want and what you need is you need to see them the way God sees them. You know, and let me give you a couple of scriptures. You know, if you're familiar with the book of Jonah, you know, Jonah and the whale and all of that is a very familiar Bible story. But if you've never like, if you just heard it as a Bible story or heard it as a kid in Sunday school or VBS, I encourage you to go back and read. It's only four chapters, but go back and read the book of Jonah because there's a lot of details in it. And remember Jonah, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and to preach and he promptly got on a boat and went the opposite direction. Let me read a portion of Jonah chapter four, the fourth chapter. This is after he got swallowed up by the whale and spit out. This is after he did what God told him to do and preached at Nineveh and then the, the Ninevites repented. And so we're in the last chapter of, of Jonah. Jonah four, starting at verse one says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong because Jonah preached and then they repented and then God forgave them. And this seemed very wrong and he became angry and he prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That's why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life for it's better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it? Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah's praying. He's going off. He's doing number one, right? He's being honest with God. Like, this is how he felt. He said, this is why I didn't want to come in the first place, because I know how you are. I know you're loving. I know you're forgiving. I know you're kind and compassionate. And I knew that if I preached to them and they heard me and they asked you to forgive them, that you would forgive them. And Jonah felt like they don't deserve forgiveness. He didn't want them to be forgiven. He wanted God to destroy them because the Ninevites, were cruel they were cruel and heartless to the hebrews they were cruel to jonah and his people you know and jonah was like they don't deserve i'm telling you that they're i there this is a very human moment jonah was a prophet he loved the lord god spoke to him but he was feeling a way you hear me he was like this is exactly why he prayed and he told god this is why I ran in the first place. This is why I didn't want to go in the first place because I know how you are. I know that you are a forgiving God. And these people don't deserve forgiveness because they had wronged him. They had wronged, they had wronged um, the, his people. And, and he says, and I knew it was going to end up like this. And so, you know, he's there. He's laying on the beach. It's hot. God allows a plant to grow up. You got to read the whole thing. And then the plant dies the next day. So I'm going to jump down to verse 10. Jonah 4.10 says, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, which are more than 120,000 people? Who cannot, who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also so many animals. God says, you want me to destroy these people. It's 120,000 people, not including 
animals. He said, because I love animals too. Maybe that could be a whole lesson how much God loves animals. He says, not even including the animals that I would kill if I destroyed this city. And he says, and you don't want them to me to forgive them, but the truth of the matter is they don't, they're living in, one version says they're living in spiritual darkness. The NIV, which I'm reading from, says these people can't tell their right hand from the left. God says, I know they're terrible and I know that they are cruel, but he says, I, but they don't know any better. That's what God is saying. God is saying they don't know any better. And sometimes the people who hurt you and they, they wrong you, they are living in spiritual darkness. They don't know any better. They're doing what human their human nature does. And God says, you want me to destroy them. And I, I give you this text because I want, as we pray and ask God to allow them to, as we pray and ask God to allow me to see them the way you see them, he will do this, that. And what it will do is it will breed compassion. It will breed compassion and mercy. All the things Jonah said that God had, he was like, I knew you were going to do this. And this is why he wanted to do it in the first place. God, um, Jonah says, you are gracious. You are compassionate. You are slow to anger. You are abounding in love. Like all these things Jonah says um, to all, he said, he says to, uh, Jonah says to God, I already knew you was like this. And I want you to be gracious and compassionate to me. I want you to be slow to anger to me, but to the ones that wronged me, the ones that caused this trauma, the ones that betrayed me, the ones that hurt me. I don't want you to be kind to them. I don't want you to be compassionate to them. I don't want you to give them another chance. And God says, but they're living in spiritual darkness. And here's the thing. God is God and he's slow to anger with everybody. He is abounding in mercy and love with everybody. And what we don't want is we don't want God to be different. And so what we pray is we pray and we ask God, fill my heart with love for them. And sometimes it don't even seem possible, but there's nothing too hard for God. Fill my heart with love for them. And then let me see them the way you see them. And as God allows us to let us see them the way he sees them, then we will take the focus off of what they did and we will put the focus on their spiritual darkness and how they don't know no better and how if they knew better, they would do better and we will be gracious and we will be merciful and we will be kind and it will become easier to forgive them. We'll forgive them because they don't know any better. They're living in spiritual darkness. And so God didn't want to destroy them, which is why he sent Jonah to preach. And Jonah knew how God was, which is why he didn't want to go in the first place. Let me read one more scripture um, under this one. Because, you know, you, you, can't do, you can't skip none of these steps. You can't be like, well, I'm going to do one, two, and five, but I ain't going to do three and four. You got to do all these steps, and you have to pray for them. You got to pray and ask God to help them, to bless them, to save them, to change them. You can ask God to forgive them to show them, you know, all of that, and then ask God and let me see them the way you do. Acts chapter nine, this is about Paul. Paul, Saul, Paul, um, the, you know, wrote half the New Testament. We call him the apostle Paul now. Um, his name was really both, but this is when we, they were still calling him Saul. And this is about his conversion. He's about to be converted. Now, Paul was a mess. Paul was, um, uh, a persecutor of Christians, you know, he held, Stephen was the first, he was a deacon, he was the first martyr for Christ. When they were stoning Stephen to death for no reason other than him proclaiming Christ, Paul was holding their coats for them. Like, let me hold your coat for you while you kill this man. Like, he was that, you know, we know him as the Apostle Paul, wrote half the New Testament, all that, and we, but I'm talking about who, who used to be. I'm talking about the people who had a right to feel like he didn't deserve to be forgiven, that he didn't deserve to be used by God. And so in Acts chapter 9, verse 10 says, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered, and the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Verse 13, Ananias is like, um, excuse me, Lord. <laughs> Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here. He's come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest 
all that call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. Listen, I'm telling you, I am so glad I was not Ananias. I am so glad, you know, and if you want, I was praying, this is years ago, just, you know, try, try to put myself in the place of, you know, the characters in the Bible when I'm reading stories to really try to delve into their emotions and how I would feel if I was them. And I think I heard a lesson. I think my aunt taught it actually. And, and she was saying, imagine, um, for me, she said, imagine God telling you as his servant, his prophet, listen, there's a man praying and I want you to go and I want you to go witness to him. I want you to go pray for him because right now he's blind. And then after you pray for him, I'm going to give him his sight back. And he's the grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. I would be like, like, are you for real, Jesus? Like, that is really what I can say. Like, Paul, at this time, like, even the reason why he was in Damascus in the first place, like, he came to arrest us and kill us. Like, this is what he does, Jesus. Like, this is what he does, your people. Like, we, your people, we are the oppressed. You're supposed to be the God of the oppressed. And now you want me to go and forgive and to treat with love and compassion and pray for someone who, yes, I mean, apparently you turning his life around, but the reason he in this city in the first place is to arrest and torture and torment people like me. I'm just saying that that's a really tough pill to swallow, but that was God's expectation. I want us to understand what God was telling Ananias to do. He told Ananias to do it and Ananias is like, are you for real? Like, that's what he said. Like, do you know? I mean, of course he knows, but this is who you are asking me because what we do is we, and we don't, we're human. We, it's, it's human nature. We look at people and their behavior, how they treat us, what they did to us, what they said to us. And it's almost, if I, in my sanctified imagination, if I was Ananias, I would be like, you want me to act like he's not him? Like, you want me to act like he didn't do all the things that he's done? You do, you want me to act like I, I don't have trauma be, behind his behavior? And, you know, this is me. This is what I would be saying. And God told him, listen, go. Go because he's my chosen instrument. And that's another thing, you know, which helps us understand because sometimes we think we're not self-righteous or sometimes we think, you know, that we're a little better than we are. But I am telling you, God will call somebody. God will have a chosen instrument. And sometimes we got a problem with God, who God chose to use. Like, why would you use him? Like, why would you use her? Don't you care what they did to me? They supposed to be a preacher. They suppo I can't tell you how many times. They supposed to be a preacher. They supposed to be a teacher. They are. You know what I mean? And God still chose them and God is still using them. And just for the record... I believe that they did what you said they did. You know what I mean? But it doesn't disqualify them from being used by God because who they are is not what qualified them in the first place. God qualified them. And then he, he called them and he chose them. And that's God's grace. That's God's grace. It's just what it is. And so what we have to learn to do is we have to learn to see people the way God sees them. We have to learn to trust God. And the only way that's going to happen is for us to pray for them. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I, you we need all these steps, but this don't work without step three. So you might as well, you might as well suck it up. It don't work without step three. You're going to have to pray for them. And back to number one, be honest with God. You can even start your prayer with like, I don't believe this God. I don't believe I'm going to pray for this person. And, you know, let me answer this question before you ask it. Well, what happened if I don't mean it in my heart? Like, I'm just saying words, but I don't really mean it. Okay, well, you are still saying the words and you are saying the words because God told you to say the words and God will work on your heart while you say them. So don't not say them because you choking on them and they can't hardly come out and you feel like you don't really mean them. God, she said, step three is a little sketchy. God will do it. He will do it as it as you obey. He knows your heart. He knows that you want to obey him. He knows that you want to be right with him. He knows how hard it is for you to forgive. He knows how hard it is for you to pray for them. But all of it is intentional. 
We're taking feelings out of it. This is not about how you feel about them. And this is not how you feel about praying. You are just doing it because God said do it. And as you do it, God will change your heart concerning it. He will. It's, it's, it's a miracle. It will be a miracle. And it's like wax on and wax off. All the time you're doing it, it feels like it's pointless. It feels un, It feels unrelated. It feels disconnected. But it's not. Okay, so that's number three. Pray for them regularly and intentionally. And number four, number three, God, when, as you do number three, God will help you with number four. Number four is separate the person from the demonic spirit that is influencing them. The Bible says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5 says we are human, but we don't wage war like humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. We are in a spiritual war. There's a spiritual warfare. And so even though we are human, when we fight, we don't fight like humans fight. We don't wage war in the spirit. You can't do nothing with a knife or a gun or cussing somebody out. They don't work with this kind of fight. Um, Ephesians 6. I was going to just read verse 12, but I'm going to read verse 10 to 12. Ephesians 6, starting at verse 10. And this is the passage where Paul's talking about putting on the whole armor of God. It says, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world and against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. He says, listen, I need you to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You got to put on all the armor so that you can stand against all the strategies of the devil, like all the strategies of the devil, because we are not fighting flesh and blood enemies. We are not fighting flesh and blood enemies. Your enemy is not the person you're looking at. Your enemy is not the person that you're having trouble forgiving. Your enemy is not the one who wronged you or caused you trauma. It was the spirit, the demonic influence, the spirit working behind them. And I'm not trying to spook you out of nothing, but those who are closest to me know Wednesdays, Lord have mercy. I try not to even go out too much on Wednesdays. The devil be at me on Wednesdays. Today was no different. If it, if it can go wrong, it does go wrong. I'm telling you. And, and, you know, and so even looking at my life, it's like, it's like the joke now, man, it must be Wednesday. You're right. It's Wednesday. He be at me because, and it may be through people, but I know that it's not the person. I know that it is the enemy trying to stop me from doing what God called me to do. And so every time when you're trying to be the husband that God calls you to be, the wife that God calls you to be, the mother that God called you to be, the father that God called you to be, the employee, the faithful servant, all of a sudden you're trying to read your Bible and have devotions in the morning and everything is happening now. Didn't happen before. The baby slept through the night before. All of a sudden you're trying to get up for prayer. The baby ain't sleeping through the night no more. Like it's spiritual warfare and so these and i am not minimizing your pain or you being wronged or the trauma i'm simply saying it will become easier to forgive the person when you are able to separate the person from the demonic spirit that is influencing them they are in spiritual darkness they ain't know no better they didn't know no better the way that the devil used them and he, the bible even says that Satan is so crafty and Satan is so sneaky that he would, uh, 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 he tricks even the very elect of God if possible. I'm not even saying that the person that wronged you wasn't saved. The person that wronged you may be saved. They may know the Lord, but it doesn't mean that they are not influenced by the enemy. All of us can be influenced by the enemy. We can't be possessed but we can be influenced. And when we are not praying, when we're not, you know, spending time in the word, when we're not walking with God closely, then we are more susceptible. We are more susceptible to demonic influence and how he be planting thoughts and he be planting seeds and stuff like that. And we act out. We act out and we act out in ungodly ways and we hurt people. 
we hurt people sometimes unintentionally and sometimes intentionally and when a wound takes place then forgiveness needs to take place and one of the things that helps me is I recognize for every victim there is a perpetrator and in this instance where you need to forgive perhaps you were the victim but I promise you if you more than if you more than a week old there is a time in your life where you were the perpetrator that you were the one that offended that you were the one that was wrong that you were the one that made somebody else cry that you were the one that betrayed you aren't always the victim sometimes you're the perpetrator and you need to be forgiven too like we're all we've all been the victim we've all been the perpetrator we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and so when we recognize that like we recognize it then it becomes easier it just becomes easier to forgive I've made a decision to forgive and then it becomes easier to forgive when I can and prayer like I said number three helps as I pray for them because what happens is as I pray for them then I ask God to let me see them the way you see them then God will begin to let you see them the way he sees them and it will separate the person that God loves so deeply and so dearly the same way he loves you from the demonic influence that is influencing them. They may have been like that all their life or they may have started being like that from an age that's so young. Maybe they're fueled by their insecurity. Maybe they behave in a way that they don't even know is wrong. Like they might be, that's, that's just the way they are. That really may just be the way they are because they need, they're living in spiritual darkness. God needs to transform them in that way. You can be wrong and not know you're wrong. Psalm 19 says, how can I know all the sin lurking in my heart? Cleanse me. The psalmist said, cleanse me of my hidden faults and keep me from deliberate sin. But when the psalmist prayed that, the psalmist was growing in his walk with God and the psalmist was in a place where he acknowledged that he had that his heart was wicked he acknowledged that he had sin that he didn't even know about and he asked god to cleanse him but that's spiritual growth you have to grow to a place where you acknowledge that you're a whole mess and you even know it you have to grow to a place where you want to be different and then on top of that we don't change overnight now you know how you are you know how the different times in your life where you have hurt people or wronged people, sometimes it wasn't the, the immediate party. Sometimes it was a third party. Sometimes your actions hurt someone else from collateral damage. It wasn't even your intent to hurt them, but you still hurt them. When... Um, when David, David's a perfect example because David was a man after God's own heart. That's what the Bible says. David was God's man, but David was also an adulterer. David was also a murderer. Like people got hurt. People got hurt. Like he slept with somebody else's wife and then he killed her husband when he couldn't successfully cover up his mess. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah, he danced. We want to dance like David danced and he danced out his clothes and he praised the Lord and all of that. But I'm saying that David hurt people. And one of the people that hated David because of what he did was, was Bathsheba's grandfather. Maybe a, a, Hith, a Hithophel. I don't know how to pronounce his name. I think it's a Hithophel. But he was one of David's wise advisors and that was Bathsheba's grandfather. And he hated David after that because he was hurt. And he didn't forgive David for what David had done. Here are some things that that didn't change. David was still a man after God's own heart. David still was the king. David still was God's man. David still messed up. He was wrong. He was wrong as two left shoes. But what I'm saying to you is we want God to hate people because we hate him. And God like, no, I don't. Like maybe you didn't do that, but you did this. I forgave you. You've done things and you've hurt people that you don't even know you've hurt because of the things that you've done. And so what Ahithophel ended up killing himself over, you know, the, because he never forgave. That's the bottom line. He never forgave David. He never got past it. And the way his life unfolded after that, he ended up killing himself. And the whole thing, if you follow the paper trail, if you follow the paper trail, it follows back to what David, his boss, did to his granddaughter. I'm telling you, the Bible is life. Do you understand what I'm saying? And what we have to do is we got to forgive because unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. I wonder because I don't know if the Bible ever really reveals that David knew how her grandfather felt about him. 
if David ever even knew that he hated him on the level in which he hated him. You know, me and you would feel like he got the right to hate him. But God says, no, you don't. You got to come to me. You got to bring all that to me. And then you got to forgive him. You got to forgive. And so we got to separate the person from the demonic spirit that's influencing him. God didn't smile on that. David paid consequences. David paid consequences for his sin. We all do. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. There are consequences, but we can't police God. We can't police people, and we can't be like, well, I need to see what happened. God, like, mind your business. I got this. You worry about you. You worry about your heart being right. You worry about forgiving. And so as we pray, as we pray for them regularly, intentionally, number three, then number four, it will teach us, it will help us to separate the person from the demonic spirit influencing them. And that also will help us to forgive them. Number five, and this is a biggie. Number five, stop rehearsing it. Stop rehearsing the event to yourself in your mind and to others. You re every chance you get, stop rehearsing it. You replay, especially you need to stop telling others anyway and spreading that wildfire. But this is mainly important as we learn to forgive. You got to stop rehearsing it in your mind. Here's what happens. If someone harms you and then something triggers the thought, there's two different, say someone offends you and or harms you in some way, does something to you and you know you need to forgive them. They are no longer in your life. They're dead. You moved on. Whatever the case may be, you don't see them on any kind of regular basis. This is, this is scenario one. But some things can happen. A movie, a TV show, I don't know, a smell of a cologne or a perfume. Something triggers a thought. And when that person's thought, that when you think of that person, you replay the whole event. You replay the whole event before you know it, your teeth are gritting. Before you know it, your whole mood has changed. Before you know it, you are crying or you are devastated all over again or you're feeling anxious or you're feeling angry. All those emotions have replayed it because your mind is like a movie. Your mind is like a movie. You watch the whole movie over and over again. And I'm saying that you got to stop doing that. And there's control over that. And I'll tell you why in a second. The second the second scenario is there's someone that you have to forgive. And I say that forgiveness does not mean reconciliation. And it doesn't. But I'm not talking about a spouse that you can divorce. Or, you know, or a friend that you can be like, love you, but we ain't friends no more. What happens when it's someone that you can't get out of your life? Like what happens when it's a child that still lives in your house and you got to take care of them or a spouse that you're not trying to leave, but you still have this unforgiveness and this resentment because of what they did. And it's not, you don't want to divorce them, but you see them, you know, or a parent that you see on a semi-regular basis, someone who is actively in your life but you haven't forgiven them for something they have done, something they have done in the past, something they have done presently or both. And then every time you see them, what happens is, here's you. Every time you see them, you try to let it go. You're like, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let it go. But see, willpower don't work. We ain't strong enough for that. Like, our human nature is not strong enough for that. We decide we're going to let it go or I'm not going to think about it right now or I'm going to put it in the back of my mind and I'm going to just go and try to have a good time. Everybody going to be there. I ain't going to think about it. We just going to move on, right? That move on mess don't work. The move on doesn't work if there no forgiveness has taken place. And when you see them, you spend so much time and energy not hating them. And you spend so much time and energy not thinking about the thing they did that caused you the pain in the first place that you can't half enjoy yourself when you're in their presence. And so you feel, and so what it does is it adds fuel to the fire. Everything they say, you take it the wrong way. Everything can't do nothing right. They can't say nothing right because you have so much stored up hurt and pain that you feel you take offense to everything they say and you take offense to everything they do. And God says you, what you're doing is you are rehearsing. Philippians 4, 8 from the New Living Translation says, and now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts, fix your thoughts, fix your thoughts. What we have to do is we have to fix your thought, our thoughts. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right 
and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. You know, I heard a, a beautiful illustration. I can't even remember where I, how, where I heard it from now. It was years ago, but I heard a beautiful illustration about our mind, right? Our minds are, we really are. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And part of the problem is our minds are amazing. Our minds are amazing. Our memories are amazing. The way smells trigger thoughts and feelings. Like our minds, we're just we're just fearfully and wonderfully made because we're made in the image of God. And so our mind, your mind is like an airport. That's the illustration I, I heard. Your mind is like an airport where planes are taking off and landing, taking off and landing all the time. I mean, you like O'Hare. Like it is busy airport, right? Taking off and landing all day long. You can't control the airplane. You are the airport. You are the airport. And so when a thought, the thoughts are the airplanes and they're going to come, the thoughts come and you know, and if you are really intelligent, here's a sign of intellect. Seriously, here's a sign of intellect. The more thoughts you can hold at one time shows you that the more intelligent you are. When you can have a thought and in 10 seconds, that thought goes through a thread that leads you to something else. You done had 20 thoughts that led you down a path to something else. That is a sign of intellect. The downside of that is it becomes more necessary for you to control your thoughts when you're able to do that. Because what happens is you do it involuntarily. You do it automatically. You do it without thinking. And so if you are one of the people that God has blessed and graced, to be very intelligent, then it's going to take more intentionality to control the airplanes that land on your airport. You can't control them landing, but you can control whether or not they disembark. Don't let them jokers get off. They land and say, you are not cleared. You are not cleared to disembark. You got to go. You land it, make it take off. Do not let it stay. Don't entertain that thought. You know, my sister is queen of what if. Oh my goodness, what if this, what if that? My sister will take you down a road. I'm telling you, I ain't never seen nothing like it. What if this and what if that? And half the time is funny, but sometimes we can't, we should not go down that road. You can go down that road and be crying at the end of it. You can go down that road and be sad or mad at the end of it. And ain't none of it happened. And ain't none of it going to happen. You done conjured a whole story. You like Shonda. You done made a whole series, seven, you know, seven se um, episodes or seven series, this whole show in your mind about a person. And then once you have negative feelings or emotions, once a person has harmed you, then that story plays a part and every, every time you think of them, every time, even when it's good, even when they haven't done anything, it's like, yet, yeah, or give them time. Or, you know, everything plays a part in that. And so we have to learn to control our thoughts. You can do it because you are smart enough. But one of the things that we have to do to control our thoughts is we have to saturate our mind with the word of God. So natural intellect, natural God-given intellect. I'm not talking about um, education. You might not have no education. You might have more degrees in a thermometer. I'm not talking about education. I'm talking about God-given intellect and the degree and the speed in which you process. You know you. If you process very quickly, then you need more word on the inside of you because that's what the more word you get in, the Bible says, in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As a matter of fact, let me turn to it. That's what it says in like the, the New King James Version, but I want to read it from the NLT. Jeez, these are the words of Jesus. It's Jesus talking. I think he's calling somebody a snake or something at the time because Jesus don't pull no punches. I'm going to start at verse 33, Matthew 12, 33. It says, a tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, the fruit is good. If a tree is bad, the fruit will be bad. And then he said, I knew he was calling somebody a snake. You brood of snakes. How could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. 
whatever's in your heart determines what you say, which is um, what the New Living Translation says, but the New King James Version says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, when we say heart, we're talking about the seat of the emotions. We're talking about, you know, all of your processes and, you know, your feelings, your emotions, everything that's going on in your heart and mind. So, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever you saturate your mind with is what will come out of your mouth. And that is in, indicative of what's really going on in your thoughts all day long. And so, it is not good and it is not healthy and it works against forgiving others when you overthink and overprocess and attribute to others what they must be thinking or how this must have gone like that's what you know that's what we do in numbers chapter 13 i think it is verse 33 34 when the israelites checked out the promised land and you know that moses sent out 12 spies and only joshua and caleb came back with a favorable report the other 10 came back with a bad report the other 10 that came back with a bad report what they said was um, that there are giants in the land and we see ourselves as grasshoppers and that's what they think too. How you know what they thinking? How you know what they thinking? What they did was they projected. They said, I see myself as a grasshopper and what we do is we think that other people think about us what we think about us. And so we project. But that does not help also. Like I'm just giving you some symptoms of overthinking. Even though we are talking about forgiveness right now, that is a symptom of overthinking as well. Okay, so we have to control our thoughts. How do I control my thoughts? I got to saturate the word of God. I have to saturate myself in the word of God. I, you should read the Bible every day. And if you have trouble with your thoughts, you need to memorize scripture. You need to memorize it. You find a verse or two that applies to you that you know you need for whatever reason and you need to memorize it. You can't memorize without rehearsing. You have to, re that's actually the process of memorization is rehearsing. You rehearse it until you know it without looking at it. And so how do I, well, I rehearse it and rehearse it until I know it without looking at it. And that process of memorization is rehearsing and that's what your mind needs. That's how you keep those planes that have the negative thoughts from disembarking. I fix my thoughts. So when I go to, um, when I go to, I didn't see the thought coming. I didn't even know. And it's worse when you're blindsided. So you go to an event and you see them and you didn't know you were going to see them. Because when we know we're going to see them, we prepare ourselves. We're like, am I going to go anyway? You know what? I'm good. I'm going to do me. I'm going to go anyway. And then, you know, we get ourselves together and decide how we're going to be. Um, but we have some preparation. When you get blindsided and you see them on the street or you see them in an event that you didn't know that they were going to be at, it's jarring, right? It's jarring because you haven't forgiven them. And then all the thoughts come back. And then the movie starts to play. And I'm saying at that moment, you got to stop. And you got to begin to quote in your mind one of the scriptures that you have memorized. You, it don't even matter if the scripture is related to forgiveness. But you have to stop that thought process. Do not play that movie. Do not let that movie play out. And you can do it it's not easy and it doesn't happen overnight you have to make a decision that you're going to do it you got to pray for them regularly and be intentional about it and you have to the only way to fix your thoughts it says it I, i've read it in um i read it in Philippians 4, 8. He says, when, after he says, fix your thoughts, you're fixing them on what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Think about those things. And if you are thinking about something and it doesn't fall into that criteria, if it doesn't fall into Philippians 4, 8, if it's not lovely or honorable or true or pure or lovely, if it's not excellent or worthy of praise, then choose not to think about it. But the way our thoughts work, you can't be like, I ain't going to think about that right now. It needs a replacement thought. You got to replace it. And the only thing strong enough to fight your natural thought is the word of God. The word of God is strong enough to, to replace it. But another thought that's just a good thought, like I ain't going to think about this one that hurt me. Let me think about my another, another friend that I love. It's not strong enough. 
The word of God is the only thing strong enough to combat the movie from playing in your mind. And it will work. I'm telling you, the word works if you work it. It seems, it seems weird, almost counterintuitive, because we don't fight the way the world fights, because it is spiritual warfare. It is spiritual warfare, and it's so not natural. It's not natural because it's spiritual. That's why it's not going to be easy. That's why we have to be so intentional about it. But here's what I can promise you, according to the word, that if you don't give up, it will work. All of it is your practice and forgiving. And I said last week, I think that um, forgiveness is like an onion. You peel back a layer and then there's another layer. Then you peel back a layer and there's another layer. And that's why you have to continually go through this process. But it will work. You make a decision that you will forgive them. And you say, I forgive you. And you don't even have to say it to them. You decide that you're going to forgive them. And you say it. You say it to God. I forgive them. You say it until you mean it. And as you pray for them and you ask God to let me see them the way you see them. And you separate the, the person from the demonic behavior. And you stop rehearsing those things over and over in your mind. One day, you're going to see them. And it's going to be like, nothing. You're going to be like, oh my goodness. I really forgave them. Oh my goodness. My heart didn't fill with fear, hate, anxiety. It didn't fill with, you know, we're different people. So what we... What we feel when we see someone we haven't forgiven changes from person to person, but it's never good. For me, it might be fear. For you, it might be anger. For you, it might be hate. For you, someone else, it might be anxiety, but it's never good. Whatever it is we feel, if we haven't forgiven, it's never good. And when you get to the place where you see the person and it's nothing, like you're not trying to be okay, you are okay. That thing is, you're going to be like, okay, Jesus. All right, I see you. I see what you did there. And it, it doesn't happen overnight, but it will happen. Okay, that's number five. Number six, recognize that this work of forgiving is supernatural. It's supernatural. And that's what I was kind of alluding to when I said willpower won't do it. But again, shameless plug for my Jump Start with Jesus every morning, 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on my YouTube channel, um, Living Water with Taya Smith. We talked about recently, a couple days ago, our devotional text was Philippians 2.13. And it says that God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. For you to be tuning into the Bible study, for you to ask the questions that you asked me, send the emails that you sent me, for you to pursue it further means that you have a desire to do what God wants you to do. That's what that means. Because if you didn't, you would be like, Shh, moving on, you know. But you, you don't know how to do it. But if you asked how to do it, it's because you want to try to do it. You want to do it. And so that's why you asked how, right? God gave you that desire. The desire to please God comes from God. And the same God, the same Holy Spirit that gave you the desire to please him will give you the power to please him. So what God does, he saves us. The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us. And then we begin to grow. We begin to get convicted by stuff that we ain't never been convicted about before. And then we like, Lord, you go through a season where you feel convicted by everything, right? And then we grow. And we continue to grow in our walk with God. God will point something out. And he'll point something out like last week. We began to delve into forgiveness. I ain't see it coming either, y'all. I promise. And then we begin to delve into that. And then the whole week, from last Wednesday this week to this Wednesday, God was working on you. You know, you called, you text, you send a couple emails. Some people ask questions. Some people just gave comments. Some people gave testimonies, whatever the case may be. Okay. But it let me know that that thing was God working on you, right? He's working on you because he refuses to leave you alone. And you and then a couple people asked me, well, how? How do I forgive? And I'm simply saying that that is proof that you want to do it. You don't ask how to do something unless you want to learn how to do it. And I'm saying, God, it's a supernatural work that God has already started. He has already begun a good work in you. He will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The Bible says he will perfect those things which concern me. I want you to be, I want you to be encouraged. I don't want you to leave this Bible study discouraged. I want you to be encouraged that you already halfway there. Desire is halfway there. You desire to be right. You desire, you don't know how to forgive. You said number three was sketchy. You know, you it might be hard. It ain't going to happen overnight. But you have a desire. And the desire, it came from God. He gave you the desire to do what pleases him. And that encourages me so much because the same God that gave me the desire will give me the power to do it. 
the same God, I promise you. I promise you, he gave you the desire and then he gave me a word. He said, tell them that this is how you do it. And as you do what he's telling you to do, he will do the work on the inside. The word of God is quick and powerful. The word of God is alive. I can't explain it to you. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. I don't know how it works. I just know that it works. I just know the word works. If you get the word down on the inside of you, it will work. It will work. When them, feel, when them thoughts start to come and them feelings start to come, if you combat it with scripture and you, you ain't got to say it out loud if you don't want to. You, just, you might not even be in a place where you can say it out loud. You just begin to quote the scripture in your mind. It'll, it's alive. It's, it's alive and it will do what it does. God, like if you put it in, I'll work it. I will work it. He says, if you put it in, I'll pull it out when I need it. If you put it in, I will. Ch I will. That's what we, what does it say? Psalm 119, 11, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. He says, your job is to put it in your heart. And then I will use that word that I put in you, that you put in your heart to change you on the inside. I will conform you into a new person by changing the way you think. You do your part, I'll do my part. And so this whole how-to is just your part. And God says, if you do your part, watch and believe. I will do my part. And so recognizing that the work is supernatural will help you not to be discouraged. I don't want you to be discouraged at the length of this process. I don't want you to be discouraged if you see them tomorrow and be like, hmm, I still want to stab them in the stomach. You know what I mean? I don't want you to feel, I don't want you to feel like the Bible said he didn't work. It worked. You know, you you get in there, you made a decision. Like I made a decision. I was honest with God, I made a decision, but mm, all that's still there. That's because it was yesterday. But give it time. Let it work. Wax on, wax off. Paint the fence. Let it work. It, you know, it will work if you work it. And then the last thing, the last one is at oh, this is good. This is good. It's the last one. Ask God. This also will help you. How do I forgive? This, how do I forgive someone who doesn't de deserve forgiveness? Ask God to show you his purpose in the pain and the benefits of this betrayal. Because sometimes when it hurts so bad, we can't see how it could have a purpose. Like when we've been betrayed, we can't see how this could, what benefit like, why would you let this happen to me? Why would you do this? To, you know, not that God did it, but like, why would you even allow it? Why would you let them hurt me this way? Why didn't you show me that this is coming? Why won't you get them the way I want you to get them? You know, ask God to allow you to see the purpose. You know, one of my favorite scriptures, and don't give me no back lip, I do have favorite scriptures. Romans 8, 28 says, we know that all things, matter of fact, let me, I was going to quote it from the New King James Version, but I want to read it from the NLT because I like it. It says, and we know that God causes everything, everything, everything to work together for good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. This is actually a very well-known um, passage of scripture, but we don't always believe that the bad things work together. That thing that happened, that trauma that you endured, that thing that they did to you, said to you, how they treated you, it, had, it has a purpose. God knew that it would hurt. God knows the pain and the trauma that it caused, but it has a purpose. I promise you, it has a purpose. Lord, let me see the benefit of it. Let me, what's the purpose? Let me read another scripture. A couple of them if I have time. All right, if I read fast. Genesis 50, 20 says you this is joseph talking to his brothers they wanted to kill him they threw him in the pit they wanted to kill him you i think it was reuben that said don't kill him you know what i mean let's just let's just sell him into slavery they sold him into slavery i mean they for he didn't do anything let's see what becomes of his dreams they just hated him they hated him and they they on the surface what it looked like to me from the outside looking in what i would say if it was me they ruined 12 years of my life they ruined my life my brothers ruined my life you want to talk about needing to forgive but by time we get to genesis 50 by the time we get to the last chapter in genesis he says this to them you intended to harm me they did 
They did. They wasn't like, well, this fool is on good. No, they hated him. They wanted to kill him. They were being mean and ruthless and cruel. What they did to him, they did it on purpose. Their purpose was to put him through pain. And he says, I recognize, I'm at a place in my walk where I recognize that you intended to harm me. Like you lied on me on purpose. Like it wasn't an accident. Those are easier to forgive. You, you intended to harm me. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for my good. God saw it too, but he intended it for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. He says, I'm second in command. I'm a Hebrew and I'm second in command in Egypt during a famine. And God allowed you to try to kill me then. The harm that you did to me then, the betrayal that you did to me then was a setup because God had a purpose for my life. So he used you to get me to Egypt. You intended to harm me and it hurt me and I cried a lot of tears and I went to jail and I was innocent and you threw me in a pit and you ripped my clothes off. You destroyed my valuables. And, I, and again, you intend, you meant it for evil. Your intent was wrong. But the reason I can forgive you is because I recognize the whole time God was doing something in my life. The whole time God knew I had to get to a certain place. And so he allowed you and your hatefulness to be the vehicle that he would use to get me to my destiny. Same thing. I love Joseph because it, it seems more real. Like I could use Jesus and Judas as an example too, but Jesus is Jesus. So we like, nobody's perfect. Joseph wasn't perfect. So I like human examples of people who are messed up too. And if Joseph could forget that, then I could guess I could forgive too. But it's the same thing with Jesus and Judas. Like when Judas told them where Jesus was and then said, the one that I kiss, like you're going to betray me with a kiss. Like, that is so deep to me. That is so deep to me. But do you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, whatever you want to do, do it. My He called Judas his friend. And here's a deep thing. There were 12 disciples. Jesus had an inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He was close and to them and all of that. But Judas was the only one that he had to have. Because Judas was the vehicle to the cross. He needed Judas in his life. He needed the one that was going to betray him. He needed the one that was going to hurt him. He, and I'm just telling you that it will help you forgive the person. It was a demonic influence behind Judas. Judas was the vehicle that the devil used, but God allowed it because he had a purpose for Jesus. And he says, so I'm going to let Jesus endure this pain of being betrayed with a kiss because it is what I need to get him to the cross. He allowed jo uh, Joseph to be thrown in a pit and left for dead and then sold into slavery and then thrown into prison and have all these hard years because he says, I know what I got in store for you and I'm using it to prepare you. And so as we ask God, I know I'm out of time. Here I come. As we ask God to show us, like sometimes we can't see the forest for the trees. Ask God to show you the forest. Sometimes this tree is so, ugh. And I want them out of my life. And God, why won't you just get them out of my life? Because some people that you need to forgive is not even a season where they can get out of your life yet. And, and say, God, I feel like all I see is this tree. Show me the forest so I can see the greater purpose. And it'll be easier for me to forgive them if I recognize that you're just the vehicle to my purpose. There's just a vehicle for me to get to my destiny and what God has in store for me. Amen. Okay, we are out of time. Um, if you are watching and you never remember a time in your life where you asked Jesus to come into your heart and to save you, today is the day of salvation. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved. And so I'm going to pray this prayer. Our time is well spent, but I don't want to miss an opportunity for you to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so if you were to die today, if you're not sure where you would spend eternity, if you're not sure whether you're going to heaven or hell, pray this prayer with me right now and ask Jesus to come into your heart and to save you. And you can know that you will spend eternity with the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is your son and that he died on the cross for my sins. I accept that I am a sinner and I need a savior. Please come into my heart and save me. Make me brand new. 
Make me like you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's it. It seems hard, but Jesus paid it all. So if you prayed that prayer, you are saved. Once saved, always saved. God bless you. Listen, go back if you need to and look at these steps again. If you didn't write all down all the steps again and, and do it. And watch the Lord do miraculous things in your life and in your heart as we learn to forgive. God bless you. I love you. I'm praying for you. I will see you tomorrow um, morning, 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> Can Nicole Phillips make a cameo, please? You know what? Nikki, do you want to come in here? My sister's here from South Carolina, y'all. And then my niece just asked her to show up on camera. Y'all can log off if you want, because they just acting silly now. I don't know if she's going to come in. She ain't get up yet. Mm -mm -mm. I love y'all. I'll see y'all tomorrow morning for Jump Start with Jesus, 7 o'clock. Pray for me. Please pray for me, because my family is crazy. Y'all, here she come. Oh, I locked her out, because I knew. I didn't want her to show. Hold on. I forgot I locked you out, because I don't know. Now it's too late for my chemo. It's not too late. They're, they're right here, Nikki. Shut up. <laughs> This is my crazy sister. I love her so much. Y'all pray for me, though, because something wrong with her. <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>